Today's topic is progressivism. Progressivism is a political ideology that has a significant role to play in 20th century history and remains a live political ideology today. Uh, we're going to be discussing its history and the transformation that it brought into American politics, specifically in the 20th century. Now, this course is a course on ideas of the 20th century. Most of the ideas we're going to be talking about aren't really political ideas, though a lot of them do have political ramifications. This really is. It is a political idea, and there are a number of those we'll have to confront throughout the course, just to get an idea of what's really taking place in the 20th century. Um, so, although most of the course isn't really about political philosophy, there are places where we can't avoid talking about it. This is one of those places. Now, we might begin by thinking about general patterns that we observe in American elections, and really have observed ever since the beginning of the Republic. Every election in the past 20 years has fit a certain L-shaped pattern that people have talked quite a bit about. Um, the Democrats are strong in the Northeast and on the West Coast. The Republicans are strong in this L throughout the Mountain West and throughout the South. Now that's really something that is striking over the last 20 years, but it's not just in the last 20 years. If you observe maps of electoral results, who won which state and so on, even in the earliest elections, starting in the 18th century, you already see this pattern of New England and New York going one way, and then what was then considered the, the West, the frontier, um, you know, wild states like Pennsylvania and Georgia and so on, um, going a different way. And that has persisted, sometimes being swamped by north-south slavery, anti-slavery issues in the middle of the 19th century, but mostly that has persisted all the way along. Let's take a few recent elections. This is the 2008 elections. The blue states are the states won by Obama, the red states won by McCain. You s and notice the L, the red L there, roughly. Turn back to 2004. This was Bush in the red states defeating Kerry in the blue, but you can see a similar, wider L in that case. Turn back to 2000. You see a similar pattern. L shape, where the Democrats are strong in the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, and the West Coast, and the Republicans throughout this L. Here's 1996, when Clinton was reelected, a similar kind of pattern. 1992, a little bit more confused there, but you see still the message of the L that we're talking about. Sorry? Oh yes, Ross, yes, Perot got 19% of the vote. And as we'll see, there are occasions where there's a third party candidate who really does confuse this. One of them is the election we're really leading up to to talk about as a major watershed election in American politics. That's 1912, where there were three candidates who were actually very evenly matched. Now, if you look at this pattern, it does go back to the earliest days of the United States. Roughly speaking, and very roughly speaking, one party has represented urban interests. So, Broadly speaking, creditors as opposed to debtors, finance, big business, large industry, uh, but also the urban poor. And so one party has represented sort of the rich and the poor. The other party has represented what you might bro say, broadly say is the countryside, areas outside the large cities. So debtors, agriculture, small business, small towns, and in some ways the middle class. Now everybody claims to represent the middle class because most people identify themselves as middle class. But if you look at sort of where people gather their political support, you see one party is strongest in the large cities, um, and especially on the coast, the other party is stronger in small towns, in the countryside. And that pattern, even when it's Federalists versus um, Democrats slash Republicans, when it's the Whigs <laughs> against the Democratic Party and so on, all of that basic kind of divide persists. But what's remarkable about this is that if you look at the pattern that was existing oh, a little more than 100 years ago, and then look at the pattern today, the parties have switched places. Here is the 1896 election in which McKinley defeated William Jennings Bryan. You see the same L pattern, right? But now it's a blue L rather than a red L. The Republicans won the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, the West Coast, and throughout the South and the Mountain West, it was the Democrats. <coughs> You see something similar in the election of 1900. Again, a big blue L, right? This was McKinley defeating William Kennedy Bryan again. Bryan ran for president three times and lost every time. But as you can see, he actually won a lot of states, won a lot of support in doing that. Here's 1904, 
Well, now you can't really see the upper part of the L. It looks like just a straight north south thing. This was Teddy Roosevelt defeating Parker. 1908, you can see a little bit of the glimmerings of the L left. Um, but it, there again, you could interpret these north south as well as sort of urban areas versus the countryside or something like that, or the coast instead of against the middle. But in any event, that, that's Taft defeating William Chetty's Bryant. But you see the same overall kind of pattern. Now this is the 1912 election. And at first glance, it looks radically different. But I said there were three pretty evenly matched candidates. Teddy Roosevelt ran as an independent. He did not get the Republican nomination. Instead, that was William Howard Taft. And so Wilson ran as a Democrat. Roosevelt ran independently as a progressive and got 27% of the vote. Taft only got 23%. So you can see Taft only won Utah and Vermont. Roosevelt won Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, South Dakota, Washington, and California. Wilson won everything else. Sorry? It's like a lot, but the population really didn't vote the majority of Wilson. Yeah, right. It's for, exactly. Yeah, right. Wilson won seemingly overwhelmingly in the Electoral College with only 42% of the vote. The two Republicans combined have 50%. So it, there, it's a weird election in a number of different ways, as we'll see. If you look at it by county, the L pattern reemerges a little bit. You can see more of an L like this in the blue support, and you get more of a sense. But even that's misleading, because after all, there were lots of places where Taft and Roosevelt combined had more than 50%, but Wilson nevertheless had more than either of the others. So that gives you some idea of what was going on. Now, this is 1916, when Wilson won re-election against Hughes. But now look at that in comparison with 2004. Um, yeah, really similar, don't they? <laughs> but the colors have switched places. So, in a way, that's behind the point that I want to investigate here. What on earth happened? Between 1916, when there was a certain pattern in that L was a blue Democratic L, and 2004, when it became a red Republican L, how did the parties somehow switch places? Well, let's take a look at the ideology of the parties and try to understand what happened. The Republican ideology throughout the 19th century um, was one that inherited largely from the Whig Party, which descended from the Federalist Party. And you might capture the ideology in Henry Clay's American system. In the background there, you can see the image of Henry Clay. He was one of those famous politicians of the 19th century, though he never became president. And he developed something known as the American system, also called the American way. Um, and it was really the political program, you might say, that was fought about throughout much of the 19th century when people weren't fighting about slavery, which was, when I put it that way, it sounds like it was hardly ever. But actually, it was one of the dominant things of the 19th century. The general idea behind this American system was that government exists for a certain purpose. It exists in order to create a framework for liberty. So the idea is that it's to develop this framework and to protect it. Now, in part, that means protecting people from harm, both harm internally against people who would injure them, also externally against foreign aggressors. But beyond that, developing a kind of infrastructure. So the Republican Party throughout the 19th century stood for tariffs. This was the government's main way of raising funds. There was no income tax at that time. And so tariffs on foreign goods were the way that the government raised most of its money. That was the main election, uh, issue in the elections that were late in the 19th century. The creation and then sustenance of a federal bank, and then building infrastructure, building roads, building canals, um, doing things to enable people to get around the country more easily. So it was basically having taxes that were at a significant level, having a centralized federal bank, and building infrastructure. The Democratic Party stood for the opposite in all these respects. Here is Grover Cleveland in the background. Cleveland was a highly successful Democratic politician near the end of the 19th century who was elected president twice. Um, he failed at re-election and then ran again later and so served two separate terms. The only person in history who's done that. Anyway, the Democratic Party is represented by Cleveland, really throughout the 19th century, opposed the Republican idea as giving the federal government too much power. It was basically a libertarian party, so it stood for free trade for lower taxes, for hard money, 
Um, for, uh, but on the other hand, usually, especially at the beginning of the 19th century, a hostility toward a central bank. And then for minimal government, uh, for a very strict interpretation of the Constitution and the limits that it placed on the federal government's activities, so that the federal government was actually quite weak. It stood for the rights of states and the powers of states against the power of the federal government. Now, you might be looking at this with a state of puzzlement. That doesn't sound very much like today's democratic leader. <laughs> and indeed, it changed dramatically in the 20th century. There's Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who sort of symbolizes a new conception of the Democratic Party. In the 20th century, the Democratic Party has opposed that Republican idea, but in the opposite direction, saying it gives, gives the federal government much too little power. So it has stood for, broadly speaking, protectionism and high taxes, relative at any rate to the Republican idea, for allowing currency to not be tied to high, high things, to allowing it to inflate and change in value, and to a very extensive federal government, and in particular a very loose interpretation of the Constitution as not restricting the power of the federal government very strongly. Now you can see that's just the opposite of the 19th century Democratic Party. So roughly speaking, what happened is that the Democratic Party leapfrogged the Republican Party. It used to be, let me see if I can get this right from your point of view, it used to be clearly to the right of the Republican Party, and then it jumped over to be significantly to the left of the Democratic Party. How did that happen? And why did it happen? What went on? Well, the switch came about largely as the result of William Jennings Bryan, the person who ran for president three times and lost every time. He ran on a, a party platform that was quite different from the platform that the Democrats had used up to that time. It was one based on easy money, getting away from the gold standard, populism, and class conflict. Now that really had not been a significant theme throughout 19th century politics in the United States. There really wasn't a lot of controversy, rich versus poor, um, the idea of class. There wasn't this sort of populist element until pretty late in the 19th century when it became a growing force, partly because of a series of economic crises. In 1908, he added to the platform an income tax, which was passed later under the Wilson administration, and then also prohibition on alcohol and the war on drugs, actually, were started by progressives around this time. Brian thought of himself as a progressive. He was one of the early people to define that term and think of it as a separate political ideology. Now, people at the time recognized this was very different from what the Democratic Party had stood for before. And in fact, here's a political cartoon <coughs> that shows Jennings, William Jennings Bryan's populist party swallowing the Democratic Party. You see the poor donkey wow. getting swallowed by a snake <laughs> headed by Bryan. But anyway, it did change the nature of the Democratic Party very dramatically. Now, why? Well, here's roughly the idea, I think. The Democratic Party throughout the 19th century had stood for decentralization. The idea is that it's good if enterprises, businesses um, are relatively small. It's good that power doesn't collect in any one group or any one area of the country or any one industry. The idea really was that we're all better off if there are no large forces that have immense economic or political power. And so it favored a kind of decentralization, as long as everybody was more or less equal, and people didn't have, uh, well, I say everyone, <laughs> with certain limitations. Um, but as long as people, in most respects, were relatively equal, things would go well. There was a danger to centralization. But the Democrats thought, as long as things were allowed to progress naturally, things wouldn't centralize. You didn't really have much danger of people being in a position to abuse their power. And so all you had to do was leave things alone. It was by people seeking more power that you got into trouble. But then came the era of corporations. We've talked about the expansion of affluence in the late 19th century. Part of what that meant is that it was possible to create companies that became large national enterprises. Before that, most companies were things that operated locally. Right? If you had a dairy, it was a dairy that operated in a very small region, um, in a part of a city, let's say, or in one part of a state. You had other kinds of businesses that were local in that respect. For the first time, transportation, technology, production had advanced to the point where there were advantages to mass production, where people could move products from one place to another, where they found enough markets in various places because of growing affluence for people to buy their products. And so corporations began to grow large, and many of the corporations we take for granted today really got their start in the last half of the 19th century. 
Well, progressives such as Bryan began to worry that economic power was starting to centralize, that due to these economic forces, there was no longer this natural decentralization of power. All of a sudden, power was collecting in a few hands. At one point, as we'll see later, Franklin Delano Roosevelt worries that in another 50 years, there will be 50 people who run everything in the United States. He was writing that in 1932. And so he thought, all of this power is flowing to a few places. We have to do something about this centralization. And so it led progressives to think this idea that things would work out well with a weak government, naturally, was wrong. Instead, things were centralizing without the power of government. You needed power to counteract this, you need this power that economic forces were pushing into corporations. So the idea, and I don't know if my picture illustrates this or not, but think of this as these economic forces of centralization that are pushing things toward the middle. You need, the idea was, a strong central government to counteract the power of these corporations. And so the thought was the government had to centralize political power itself, use that against to counterbalance the corporations, and in that way sort of force things back out from the center. So these were the sort of corporate economic forces pushing things in towards the center. <coughs> government was this larger ring here, darker gold, that's pushing things out again. And to some extent doing that in various ways, to some extent directly doing it by opposing corporations. Well, now, this creates a, a sort of obvious problem, and a problem that starts dominating, especially American politics throughout the 20th century. Why won't that centralization threaten liberty at least as much? Okay? Notice what happens. You've got this centralized economic power, but now you've got to have a government that's at least as powerful, right? So you're creating a very powerful centralized force. Well, throughout history, the Democratic Party had opposed that as leading to corruption, and oppression and inequality and so on, well, why won't putting that in the hands of the government do the same thing? Moreover, government not only has to be more powerful in order to constrain the corporations, also, you have to rely on it to go in the opposite direction. Why won't it be captured by the corporations? Moreover, the government has the power to coerce. The, po the government can force you into, into things. Corporations can't do that, right? <coughs> Suppose I have a business. Can I make you buy my product? No. Probably not. Maybe if I'm a utility, right? If I am, depends on electric. Yeah, if I'm the electric company or the water company, in a sense, you don't have to buy my product. You can generate your own electricity or dig a well. Um, but on the other hand, it's difficult to avoid buying my product. Most corporations, though, aren't like that. Suppose you hate Apple computers. You don't have to buy their product. Suppose you hate Coca-Cola. Well, you don't have to buy their product. And so there's not really, for, in mo most cases anyway, that sort of coercive power. Government isn't like that. You, can, you can't just say, I'm sorry, I don't want to pay my taxes. I prefer to pay taxes to some other country. Uh, that doesn't work. Okay, so it doesn't look as if there's got to be an even greater danger here, both because there has to be more power and because government has the power to coerce in a way that a corporation doesn't. But is that decisive? Well, that continues to be, you might say, a motivating issue in our politics. Now, I want to return to the watershed election of 1912, because if you can pinpoint one spot at which the Democratic Party jumps from one conception, that laissez-faire, libertarian, 19th century idea, to the modern progressive idea, it's in 1912, and in the person of Woodrow Wilson. Really there, I think, the Democratic Party decisively jumped from right to left. Now, it took a while for that to sort of seep down into the rank and file, and for the picture that emerges from electoral results to really quite keep up with that. But that, in a sense, is what happened. The Democratic Party changed its ideology in a fundamental way. So to return to that election, Wilson won 42% of the vote, Roosevelt 27%, but also on a progressive platform. Taft, who was opposing progressivism, only 23%. And so, although he had a minority of the popular vote, Wilson won overwhelmingly in the Electoral College. Now, as I said, Roosevelt was running for re-election. He had been a successful president, a popular president, but he didn't get his party's nomination. He was running for a third term, and the Republicans thought, modeling, modeling themselves on George Washington's example, that was a bad idea. So they nominated Taft instead. Uh, Roosevelt was furious. He was also trying to bring progressive ideas into the Republican Party, and the Republicans weren't having much of it. And so he ran as an independent. Now, Wilson, throughout the campaign, campaigned against Roosevelt's 
<coughs> phrase, new nationalism, which is what he called his nationalism. But in office, Wilson did almost exactly the same thing. He implemented Roosevelt's program and turned out to be more of a progressive than the self-proclaimed progressive of Roosevelt. So in a certain sense, um, Wilson didn't talk a lot about his goals until he actually got into office. Now, there's a picture of Woodrow Wilson throwing out uh, the first pitch at the World Series. Look at this guy behind right <laughs> anyway, Wilson proclaimed a new spirit in the age. He published a lot of his speeches in the form of a book called The New Freedom, which is what I asked you to read uh, excerpts of. And he advocates this new spirit of the age, a commitment to radical change. I've got some random photographs here just showing you what life in 1912 was like. Um, there you see, uh, this is actually a wedding party, wedding photograph, lots of frilly dresses, and in tuxedos. The men don't look so strange by a contemporary standard, but the women certainly do. In any case, he's arguing for radical change. He says, we are in the presence of a new organization of society. Our life has broken away from the past. The life of America is not the life it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. We've changed our economic conditions. He's talking here about the rise of corporations, absolutely from top to bottom, and with our economic society, the organization of our life. The old formulas don't fit the present problems. They now read like documents <coughs> taken out of a forgotten age. So really, he's saying we need a radical break from the past. Forget these political ideologies from the 19th century. That was all designed for something else. We now have a new sort of circumstance. And in particular, what makes it different for corporations? I've added some uh, emphasis here to, to let you see certain phrases. What's so bad about corporations? Well, they make you as an individual powerless. You have no access to the people who are really setting your policies. Um, you really have no voice. You must obey their orders. Um, you're going to often, with deep mortification, realize they're asking you to do things that are not in public interest. Your individuality is swallowed up in these great organizations. And so he sees corporations as the enemy of individuality, as your enemy in some way. Well, what has to be done about it? Well, you have to totally reconceptualize government, politics, and what it is to be human. He says this is bringing about a new social age, a new era of human relations, a new stage setting for the drama of life. And here you can see an automobile from the Wilson administration of Model T Ford. Okay, but he sees not only really the rise of corporations, but the rise of mass production, large factories, in short, industrialization, as bringing about a new kind of social problem. So he argues for a radical reconstruction of society. He says we've got to reconstruct economic society and political society in a ra radical modification of our political processes. Well, what do we have to do? How do we change this? Okay, what, is, what it really is the problem, and how can we respond to the problems? He says, well, we've got to harness the formative and progressive forces of society. And here is really a quotation that I think is remarkable, especially for those of us who work in educational institutions. Before he became president, Wilson was the president of Princeton University. And before that, he was a professor at Bryn Mawr. Um, well, then and now, a, a women's college. He apparently was um, motivated to leave Bryn Mawr because he thought it was sort of insulting to have to teach women. <laughs> but in any event, he moved to Princeton, became president of Princeton. And he said, I used to say, when I had to do with the administration of the educational institution, that I should like to make the young gentlemen of the rising generation as unlike their fathers as possible. Not because they lack character, intelligence, or knowledge, but because their fathers were out of sympathy with these creative, formative, progressive forces of society. Well, what are these progressive forces? Now, to understand that, we have to realize that he's looking to Europe for a model. And what he finds in Europe is a highly successful journey led by Otto von Bismarck um, in the historical period that Wilson made his name <coughs> studying. And Bismarck was not around anymore by the Wilson administration. But on the other hand, Wilson was very interested in the late 19th century history. He had this example of a highly successful and unified Germany. And he said, ah, that's the secret. And where did Bismarck get his ideas? From Hegel, who you might recognize from earlier lectures. In particular, Hegel had something called the philosophy of right, which was his political philosophy, 
And we've talked about some of the ideas there. He sees truth, meaning, and your own identity as really relative to society, as depending on social relationships. Um, society constitutes individuals, not the other way around. So society really comes first, not individual people. And the world is the unfolding of Geist, which is a German term that's usually translated as spirit. The world's spirit moves and exhibits itself throughout history, and it does what it does. <laughs> and you have to look at the whole, because it's the development of the whole that tells you what's really going on. Now, there are six main ideas I want to focus on. And as we'll see, Wilson advocates all of these ideas. The first one is a biological metaphor. Hegel says the state isn't really based on a contract. It isn't some kind of mechanism for balancing. It is an organism. In fact, it's one organism. <laughs> now, if you stop and think about that and think, wait a minute, society is like an organism. What follows from that? Ooh, it dies. <laughs> That's a sort of disturbing one. Yeah. If you, if you think about this hard enough, you realize, oh, that's bad news, right? Organisms die. So that's kind of a long term bummer. Um, but what else is the case? Yeah. Ah, okay. Organisms need food and energy to live, right? And so it needs to be maintained. It's not something that can be allowed to just go off on its own. It needs to be nurtured and maintained. Yeah. All parts are necessary for function. And in fact, the whole is prior to the part, right? I mean, my body is not just a collection of fingernails and hand and arm and leg and so on. It's something that, you might say, my identity comes first. And then it's my hand. These are parts of me. And so similarly, that means the individual is to be thought of as just a part of society, not as having any independent value. Yeah? An organism doesn't operate the way the US government still operates, which is arguing with itself. Ah, okay. Like one part doesn't refuse to do what another part needs done to sustain it. Good, good. Organisms don't tend to be at war with themselves in a way that our government is actually set up to be at war with some parts opposed to another, right? I mean, you've not all organisms think the same way. I mean, like, if you had the government mm. in 100% cooperation, then that would mean that everybody in society would be in 100% cooperation, and we're just not. Good. Okay, yes. An organism exhibits a kind of unity that a government doesn't and maybe shouldn't. So I can think, I'm hungry, I want an ice cream cone, and I go get one. But do we as a society do that? Do we decide, we want ice cream cones, so let's, let's do it? Uh, no, right? Some people want ice cream cones. Some people say, no, I want to study. Other people say, I prefer something with a little more alcohol. And, <laughs> you know, in short, we go off in different directions. And so you might say, look, an organism can't do that. My hand can't just say, you know, I'm tired of teaching this class. I want to go play the piano. And my hand just walks out of the room and leaves and does it. Uh, that doesn't work, right? And so there's an obvious disanalogy. If I'm to press the analogy, I have to say, well, I'll tell you what, we have to stop all that in society, right? I mean, some people doing this and some people doing that, that's bad. In an organism, that would lead to big trouble. Well, so we better stamp it out in society. And so you can start thinking, wait a minute, there's a unity to an organism that society doesn't seem to exhibit, the government doesn't seem to exhibit. And on this model, it seems like, well, we better make it exhibit it, which is a scary prospect. Other things you might notice following from this biological metaphor. Yeah, an organism, an organism has to adapt, and so sometimes society has to adapt. OK, good. An organism has to adapt, so sometimes society does too. And in a sense, that's behind Wilson's idea that this is a radical change. We're in a radically new environment, so we have to adapt. We have to change our response to that environment in order to stay fit. And so this is one of the ways in which he's going to exploit this to try to say, yeah, sometimes you have to realize, wait, there's a flood. I better learn to swim. <laughs> and you know, in that way, evolve and change in order to adapt to the new conditions. Yeah, like um, people in society, I guess what he's getting at is that people in society have to like sacrifice their own personal goals and stuff for the greater good of society as a whole, which I guess you're yes. talking about in the first point. Which is kind of no, right, just as, you know, there might be occasions where I have to sacrifice some part of my body that threatens the unity of the whole, right? Suppose I develop um, appendicitis, let's say then we have to cut out my appendix, right? And so similarly, there might be parts that start threatening the body politic, and we have to get rid of them. And so there's an idea, look, we have to maintain this unity, and if some part starts conflicting with the whole, we have to side with the whole against the part. Yeah. There's only one central nervous system. 
Oh, right, there's only one central nervous system in an organism. So similarly, there's going to be only one central nervous system in society. Well, what's it going to be? The state. The state. Yeah. It sounds like communism. A little bit. Um, a little bit. Yeah, it's... It sounds like Big Brother kind of stuff. It sounds like Big Brother kind of stuff. Yes, it sure does. Um, there are a variety of manifestations of this throughout the 20th century. Um, some versions that try to maintain a commitment to democracy and other versions that don't. And so what we're going to see throughout the term is that there is an idea here that gets manifested in the transformation of the Democratic Party throughout the, the 20th century, that gets manifested in a different way in communist societies, that gets manifested in still another way in fascist societies, and so on. But at, a, at root, it's a sort of same core conception, but then it gets expressed in very different ways. Now, I don't mean to say in saying that, that all of those things I've mentioned are really the same idea. They do get manifested rather differently and with very different views about what this means for democracy and, and so on. Nevertheless, there's a common intellectual core that's driving a bunch of different ideologies throughout the 20th century. Yeah? Is it fair to say Wilson only takes a very small portion of this? He seems to compromise these ideas in that he still seems to believe in private agency, but perhaps on a smaller scale than corporations. Ah, good. Yeah. Part of what differentiates progressivism from those other ideologies like communism or fascism is that there's a thought that, wait, the state has to do this in order to get power back to the individual, <laughs> okay? Just as, think about an organism. We have to get blood to the, the whole body, right? I mean, you can't just sort of cut off part of it. So um, we need to sort of have things flowing back toward the individual, and that's really the reason for the centralization of power in the first place. Whereas in a communist society, in a sense, there's a similar idea. It's all for the sake of the proletariat, ultimately. But there's no thought that any individual proletarian really matters much. <laughs> um, whereas in the, the evolution of the Democratic Party, that's not the idea. It's not like, oh, so the parts have no importance. The parts are, in a sense, important still. In fact, they're the rationale for doing the whole thing. So, uh, so yes, I mean, the degree to which people buy into this picture and the extent to which they try to reconcile it with other ideas very significantly. Yeah? But to say that Wilson only takes a little bit from that, might be like, I don't know, I just, I kind of disagree because didn't he, he started the income tax, right? Yes. Which levies a huge amount of power from the government and also, okay, we can like start this, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> oh, and also, didn't he also have the thing where during World War One, if you spoke out against the government, he had that, uh, what was it called? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're going to get there. So let's so, talk I mean, about the individual. The state can do no wrong with infallibility. So yeah, 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 yeah. Be, okay. Yes, Wilson bought into much more of this than you might think. Okay, in that respect, Wilson was not a typical democratic politician throughout the 20th century who takes some elements of this and combines it with some elements of traditional ideas from American politics and so on. He bought into this much whole hog to a much larger extent than most of his successors. So in particular, we're going to see some shocking things that he did. He really did think the state can do no wrong. Um, he thought, at one point, in discussing congressional politics, he says, I find it hard to imagine political power that is not good. Uh, <laughs> well, after World War I, as we'll see, people found it very easy to imagine political power that was not good. But he really thinks, no, the state can do no wrong. He thinks, no, 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 no trade-offs have to be made. There are no factions that really have to be balanced against each other, any more than you have to balance the right hand against the left hand. There's one brain, um, and one good for the organism. Everything is really political. He says the government is going to have to get involved in the framework for every aspect of life. Every single thing. There's nothing that is out of bounds. Yeah. So is it fair to say that his very limited endorsement of private enterprise in the reading we had might have just been a concession, but not something truly believed in, based on what is it, said? Well, it's a good question. When he talks about private property, and really, if you get to the idea, to go back to the, um, this mock, oh yeah, further back from thought. <laughs> If you go back to this little picture of the um, centralization, if you think, how does he reconcile that idea? What's the significance of the decentralization? Why does that matter? I think he has to help the individual and private property and free enterprise and so on playing some role. Otherwise, why not just centralize everything? The fascist basically says, yeah, let's centralize it all and be done with it. That's fine. He's not trying to do that. But why? He's got to assign the parts some role that's more significant. But how we how he balances all of these is hard to that's figure out. Yeah. yeah. But isn't this 
Ah, uh, yes, real politic in foreign affairs becomes an expression of this as well. If I am an organism and trying to respond to my environment, what do I have to do? I have to shut the door, for one thing. <laughs> If I am an, an, organism, an organism trying to survive, I have to, in some cases, change. I have to change my environment in some way. I have to think about my own survival first and my own good, and that's something that the society has to do, too. So in foreign affairs, Wilson is torn between Bismarck's idea of real politic, where you do what's in your own self-interest, and then his idealistic thing that, no, 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 you want to be moral. And so we'll see those conflicts next time when we look at what happens at the end of World War I. You're absolutely right. They're, they're, just as there is a tension here between centralizing and, and decentralizing, so then there becomes a tension between upholding high moral ideals and just facing political realities. Let me jump ahead to some of the specific things that are parts of this idea. Yeah, for, idea, for example, the idea that society and that the state is really organic, we've talked about that as the fundamental one. The enlightenment picture was that the state results from a contract. Pictured here. Hey, don't kill me, I won't kill you. Hey, sounds great. Okay. So we trade some degree of freedom in exchange for, well, security and Hobbes' version of this, for impartial judgment in locks, for equality in Rousseau's. What exactly we get in the trade varies from thinker to thinker, but the basic idea is that society is a contract. I agree that I won't hurt you, you agree you won't hurt me. We'll band together and uphold this sort of common system of law for our mutual benefit. If we're thinking in terms of an organism, there's no contract, right? It's not as if the right hand and the left hand exist separately, and they meet and they say, you know what, we match pretty well. Why don't we, why don't we get a body together, right? I mean, musicians can do that. They can say, hey, we ought to form a band. Well, hands don't go around saying, hey, we ought to form a body. Let's, <laughs> let's have a contract. Um, no, instead, it grows like an organism. That organism can be healthy, it can be unhealthy, but its existence, even though it might depend on parts like the heart or the lungs or what have you, it's not that the parts start out being there and then form the body through a contract. Well, we've already talked about this in a lot of ways. Hegel sees society as one organism, the parts have to work together. They don't have any independent importance. The mutations are bad. By a large, progress occurs by a conscious effort toward a goal. The Enlightenment idea was, no, society is more like a species, more like an ecosystem. The parts do have independence of importance, and actually mutations lead to progress. And so that's a very different idea, still an organic idea. Um, uh, the pictures there are Hegel and Edmund Spencer, who, or Herbert Spencer, I'm sorry, who developed this idea throughout the 19th century. But there's another, there's a suffragette picture, just to give you the spirit of the times. And there are the 1912 pennant winning Boston Red Wings. Anyway, government's not a machine, he says, but a living thing. And really, if you want to think of it in human terms, something more like a team than like uh, an individual person, um, where the various parts have to work together for the whole thing to succeed. Now that brings me to the second idea. The individual has meaning <coughs> only as part of this larger social group. All worth the human being has, Hegel says, he has only through the state. Well, again, there's a contrast with the Enlightenment idea that says, no, 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 individuals have rights inherently to life, liberty, and property. Hegel says, no, 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 the value of the individual is only in the state. There is no individual right to anything. That leads to a redefinition of liberty. Okay, in the Enlightenment, freedom is the absence of external impediments. It's nobody stopping you. But for Hegel, freedom is coordination with the rest of the state. Just as, what is the hand, freedom of the right hand? Well, it's to act in coordination with the rest of the body. So what is my freedom? It's to act in coordination with the rest of the group. Um, and there you see <laughs> the 1912 college football championship, Harvard beating Dartmouth. The last minute field goal. Uh, well, anyway. Yes. <laughs> What is freedom? Asks Wilson. He says, I've long had an image in my mind of what constitutes liberty. Suppose I were building some powerful machinery, and it were assembled so badly that every part, one, every time one part tried to move, it'd be interfered with by the others. That would be bad. Liberty for the parts would consist in the best possible assembling and adjustment of them all. OK, so it's having the parts fit together in the optimal way. Now, there's a machine. <laughs> 1912. But okay, that's his idea. Human freedom consists in perfect adjustments of human interests 
and activities and energies. It's us fitting together in the right way toward the whole. Now, in fact, this isn't just a philosophical point. It does lead, during the Wilson administration, to real restrictions of liberty. One of the things Wilson did is segregate the federal government. After the Civil War, the federal government had stood for desegregation, for equal rights, equal protection of the laws. Wilson took departments of the federal government, separated white from black employees, and in various bureaus, changed things so that there were separate white and black facilities. Here you see um, an administration in Washington, the colored men's waiting room, the white men's waiting room, separate areas. That was done for the first time under Wilson. Another restriction of liberty, the first military draft since the Civil War. Another one, in 1917 and then in 1918, Wilson, together with the Democrats in Congress, passed the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. They made opposition to the draft and opposition to the war illegal. Here you see women protesting outside the White House. Remember the Constitution, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. In fact, these acts went very far to abridging freedom of speech. Um, it forbade anyone from interfering with the war effort. That was understood very expansively to include opposing the war or opposing the draft. And any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the U.S. government. <laughs> so you could not insult the U.S. government. Over 400 periodicals lost their mailing privileges. They were allowed to publish. They weren't shut down, but they couldn't be mailed. More than a 1,000 convictions occurred under this act. The most famous, the poet E.E. E. Cummings, famous in part for never using a capital letter. <laughs> he said in Europe that he didn't hate the Germans. He served three and a half months in jail for saying he didn't hate Germans. <laughs> that was really all he said. I mean, it didn't have to be very profane or scurrilous. <laughs> there were other restrictions. Wilson started the Committee on Public Information as a propaganda effort. And here you see some examples. A red, bloody hand, the hug, his mark, blotted it out, the Liberty Bonds. U.S. official war pictures. Um, destroy this mad brute, the gorilla in a German helmet, and let's. Now, um, it also created a war industries board, an industrial dictatorship without parallel, has said one historian, that basically directly took over corporations and told them what to do and forced them to produce things for the war effort. The Committee on Public Information also went around the country recruiting what they called Four Minute Men. These were people who were trained to stand up and give political speeches at any kind of gathering. They were to be four minutes long, forceful, defending Wilson, defending the war, defending the draft, defending the government. And the head of it, Arthur Bullard, said it this way, truth and falsehood are arbitrary terms. There are lifeless truths and vital lies. The force of an idea lies in its inspirational value. It matters very little if it's true or false. So people were trained to just say stuff, like the Germans move in and rape women. Well, actually, the Germans, like the French and British, were just stuck in trenches. They weren't doing anything except wallowing in their own experts, uh, as we'll see next time. But there was a, an extensive propaganda campaign. And this poster, which is very famous, was part of that. It's a very different image of the federal government than either Democrats or Republicans would have advocated during the 19th century. Well, there are just a few ideas left I wanted to mention. One authority. On this head in picture, everything's political. There's no go bound to government power any more than there's a boundary to the brain's ability to control the body. And so everything becomes politics. And indeed, Wilson says, I believe government has to be involved in every relationship of life. Everything becomes a political question. Well, that means this idea of Jefferson's that government should be limited in some ways is totally screwed. So it has to take on a new role, and that gives it unlimited authority. It must exert power at every point. Now, that means, oh yes, well then, I just have 45 seconds left. So there's this little thing about a beehive. His model is the beehive. We all have to work together in the perfect beehive. And so, maybe I'll conclude today by mentioning something about how this infallible government exerting itself on every power of life inspired poet Richard Arbor. Here he's thinking about the parallel with Russia. And inspired by the Russian experts claim to have trained bees to seek nectar and pollen from specific plants in the world. How doth the regimented bee improve each shining hour? He flies to each selected tree and designated flowers. 
The state directs his every course, the state defines the sector, the state prescribes his common source, and allocates his nectar. No longer flying fancy free, no longer ranging bold, how doth the regimented be? He doth as he is. Free. 